Arkimoto is an innovative transportation company based out of Eugene, Oregon. As their company's mission statement reveals, they are part of the EV revolution and intend to help the environment not with stodgy slow cars, but with fun zippy vehicles where consumers don't have to make a choice between saving the world and having a good ride. Arkimoto's mission statement is as follows. To catalyze the shift to a sustainable transportation system, we believe that will only happen when we move away from oversized, overpriced, polluting vehicles to right-sized, ultra-efficient EVs we can all afford. We can't afford not to. Today, I'm privileged to be able to speak with Mark Fronmeyer, president of Arkimoto, and Glenn Cook, founder and CEO of EV Transports. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being in this interview today. Thanks for having us. Really great to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, first, I guess we'll start with Mark, but can you give me a very brief nutshell history of your company, when it was founded, when it went public, what sure. was the vision behind it? I read a little bit of that on Wikipedia, of course. Yeah, so. <laughs> you kind of you nailed it on the, uh, on the mission statement, uh, on the intro. But so, so I started in 2007, and I, I, I started be, the company because I went looking for something that did those things, uh, you know, right-sized, pure electric, you know, very, very efficient, affordable vehicle. And I, I just couldn't find it in the marketplace. Um, this is, you know, 2007 is sort of right, really right when the electric vehicle uh, movement was, was starting to finally catch uh, some real momentum. Um, but, but still, a lot of the endeavors out there were focused on full-size cars. Um, which, if you you know, if you think about the the energy density challenge and cost of batteries, um, we're only now in 2020 getting to the point where uh, electric cars produced at mass scale are starting to become price competitive with the top end of of sort of the average new car. Um, right. And what what I always thought from the beginning was that we need electric vehicles that are you know much, much more affordable. So for us, affordable is like a, the, the used car price range, 10,000 bucks, the cost of a toy. Um, and that's where we want to get to uh, is, is provide solutions that are, and, and when we say right size, I mean, the, 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 real, the real aha for me came from just standing on a busy street and watching cars go by and seeing one person in 4,000 pounds of steel over and over and over again. Right. And, and it's that it's it's really that sort of disconnect between uh, the car and then how we actually use cars that that <coughs> affords this opportunity for for much more efficiency and and also for a whole different level of affordability. Yeah, I noticed that. Like you know, I drive to Atlanta, unfortunately, <laughs> often enough, and and they have the HOV lane, and it's pretty unused. And so you know when it's a traffic jam and there's a ton of people slammed into the other lanes, they're only driving by themselves. Two people to get in, then all of these cars are just one person. Yeah, right. It's crazy. It's absolutely nuts to think about that. I was kind of, I, I found it rather fun when I looked up your stock ticker a couple of weeks ago or whatever, but it's not, you know, you imagine it being like ARCI or something like that. So why'd you go, go with FUV instead? Well, you know, fun utility vehicle is our flagship product. And it's it's that blend of fun and utility that we think really um, is is not just that one product, but it really is the whole platform. Uh, it makes for a very compelling ride, and it is a surprisingly useful tool. I mean, when you think about the the you take away the back seat, now you've got a deliverator. You take away the cage, now you've got a roadster. You take away you know, add on lights and sirens, now you've got a a, a great emergency response vehicle. Um, so it's a very flexible platform, very useful platform. But what what you know, we actually had a, a range of different names for it um, back in the day. But what just what happened is that over and over and over, people would drive it and they'd be like, "That is the most fun I've ever had on the road." And so we finally said, "All right, we're going to lead with fun. Fun okay. fun is the spoonful of sugar that uh, helps the clean tech medicine go down." Right. So let's, and, let's, and I think that's important, right? It's like people want to be responsible and save the planet, but it's been proven over and over again that they're not going to have a miserable time doing that because <laughs> people want to enjoy themselves while they do that. Well, and, and you know, particularly in, in these times where we're, we're all stuck at home in a pandemic that's ravaging the world. Um, you know, we've also seen that in the market, people are wanting to buy toys. So right. you know, motorcycle sales at 
Polaris are up and slingshots. And so, so we, we, you know, having, having an option in the market that actually, you know, makes people feel good when they're going to get groceries is, is not necessarily a bad thing. Right. Okay. Cool. Uh, Glenn, so, so Mark, you came on, I, I think as, if I'm getting this right, you're the founder also, as well as the president of the company. So you, you've yes. been there since the beginning. Yes. <laughs> okay. So Glenn, when did you come on board and what, what's your role with the company? Well, back in uh, 2009, I got into the transportation industry and I was working for a lot of larger corporations at the time with the motor coach industry and the uh, black car fleet limousine industry. I became part of the board of directors here in the state for the motor coach and the limousine associations about five years ago. And during that time period, I was working up at the Villages as the Vice President of Business Development. And one of the things that we started seeing a lot, besides a lot of golf carts and electric vehicles up there, was the autonomous vehicle uh, program through Voyage. And through about uh, three years ago, I got in touch with the autonomous vehicle program here in the state of Florida, which is called SunTrax. And we started to do a case study, trying to see what the early adaptation was going to be moving from combustible engines, larger vehicles into electric and autonomous fleet vehicles. Well, about three years ago, I, I just decided that I was going to start my own company to help that transition along. So I got in with the University of Central Florida i program, which started with some customer discovery. Uh, it also transitioned into what it looks like to pivot from one type of form factor vehicle into another. And at the very beginning of this summer semester, uh, we were hit with the COVID challenge. And which meant that we had to really look at our data and see what was going to be the most optimized mode of mobility here in the Central Florida area. Well, we started to see over and over again in one and two passengers, one and two passengers uh, utilizing electric fleet vehicles, zero emissions kept popping up. So we started off actually studying, studying Tesla. And we were looking at these vehicles and we were saying, man, commercial fleet operators are not going to want to spend. 50, 60, 70 thousand right. dollars just to move one and two people. The ROI does not make sense. Uh, return on investment does not make sense. So as I started uh, doing the research on this, I noticed Galileo Russell from Hyperchange had done a story on Arcimoto, and then I noticed another story from Now You Know with uh, Zach and Jesse. And the more I started following some of the content providers on YouTube, more Arcimoto kept popping up and popping up. And the next thing you know, the market takes a dive. I look into the stock. I reach out to their franchise uh, personnel. His name is uh, Sam Vitapaldi. And I said, look, my data shows that you guys are going to be the solution for mobility and one and two passengers, which is basically 85% of the data that we were getting. And he said, sure enough, that's exactly what uh, the reason why market even started the company. So through months and months of bantering back and forth and talking to the city and sustainability, um, I had been working with the University of Central Florida, who had also been working with the Department of Sustainability in, in the city of Orlando, and we started doing the negotiations for bringing a pilot study to the city of Orlando. And Great. as of last week, we launched the pilot project. <laughs> I was going to say, this is hot off the press right now. It's um, it's a very cool looking pilot study, too. And I love the fact that there's a... Uh, uh, what do you call it? A test track or whatever with all like neighborhoods and simulated highways and all those kinds of things. So you that's can the really, sun tracks. Yeah. Yeah. The sun tracks. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's partially built at this point. Is that correct? Yeah. It's partially built as far as the infield, the outside, which is basically kind of like the racetrack, uh, like Daytona speedway. It's a two and a half mile track uh, and it's designed for electric and autonomous vehicles. Cool. All right. Um, well, I guess maybe back to Mark here. Uh, so I just, I wanted to get your thoughts about your first, the FUV, the, your first vehicle. Um, I, I have a feeling that when people first look at it, they might think it's a golf cart <laughs> and they're like, geez, what the heck? So, you know, is it a golf cart? I assume you're going to say no. Um, why this form factor rather than a traditional form factor? What are its advantages? What's its ideal use case, et cetera, et cetera, things like that. So all, all, all good questions. Uh, we, have, we have no aversion to golfers. We think golfers <laughs> enjoy the FEV. So we have a, a golf club uh, rack attachment option uh, that, we've, uh, that we've worked through prototypes. Um, whether your course will allow you to ride it on the course uh, is going to be on a course by course yeah, basis. I'm thinking 75 miles an hour on a golf course might be a bit of a <laughs> think, software we'll limit. Have, we'll, we'll eventually have a geofencing uh, uh, throttling uh, capability so that, you know, golf courses could say you can only go, you know, 15 miles an hour in this geographical area and the right. vehicle would obey that. 
okay. um, which I think that w- would make it probably more palatable to course managers. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it, people, it, we, we definitely have taken uh, design cues from, you know, not just golf carts, but uh, off, off-road recreational vehicles, uh, eight, you know, uh, side-by-sides and so on. So it, it definitely has that, that power sports aesthetic. Um, and that's partly just because of the materials and methods that we're using to build the vehicle. Um, also, it's, it, is, it is just, it's really fun to be in the world um, and, and also have, you know, also have a roof and a windshield and uh, seats that have heaters in them and seat belts and so on. So oh, we, I did we, not know you had heaters in the seats. Nice. Seats and grips. <laughs> yeah. Makes a big difference. Maybe not so much in Florida, but but certainly here in Oregon. It's, right. a, it's a big selling feature at this time of year. Well, this time of year in Georgia too. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but when it comes to, you know, the, the form factor of the vehicle, that is the reverse trike, two wheels in front. Uh, the battery is actually right down the center line at the bottom of the vehicle. The drivetrain is in front. So the, the two front wheels are driven. Uh, and in our case, we have our own uh, gearbox, dual motor gearbox. So two motors drive independent gear trains out to the two front wheels. Um, we think that that is, it's really, it's a platform that is designed around being a battery vehicle. Uh, you know, the, the vehicle platform architectures that you see in the world, actually the drivetrain makes a big difference in terms of how v- the vehicle itself is architected. And so we really went uh, just you know, sort of, sort of started over from a clean sheet about what a what a what a vehicle should be if you have uh, an electric drive and you want to make it small but have a very good ride and a lot of carrying capacity. And it took us actually you know, eight iterations of development in the over the course of the first seven years of the venture to settle onto the form factor that we have now, and it is. Uh, you know, it, it, it really is, a, a, to our knowledge, a unique new vehicle architecture for the world. Right. Yeah, it looks, it looks like a lot of fun, but also it's, with the roof and everything, it's protected too. So it gives it some element protection, which is really cool. So I'm sure being from Oregon, you care about that because you get a lot of winter rain. <laughs> it does rain quite a lot here. And, and there, it is a really nice feeling to, to have, uh, you know, to have a heated seat, heated grips, and the the fairing keeping the water off as you're cruising down the road it's just it, it you know it, it it makes driving outside in a in a rainstorm actually pretty entertaining okay that's cool um so i i noticed that uh at least as far as i understand it sandy monroe who if people don't know he's <laughs> he's mr big shot right now he's the automotive okay. expert of automotive experts but he has been speaking really highly of three-wheeled vehicles recently and i believe he has a relationship with your company too so did he help with that and what about the three-wheeled design yeah we're, we're actively engaged right now with monroe and associates for for, for the next i mean i would anticipate at least a couple of years to bring Arkimoto to mass production. Um, so they're, they are, uh, uh, I think, probably best well known for their benchmarking, which is reverse engineering of, of uh, primarily of cars and electric cars um, uh, in particular. Uh, they, they did very detailed teardowns of Tesla's Model 3, Model Y, um, and, uh, but, but they also do uh, the, the part of, that you don't see is, is their original product development work. And so they've done a, a ton of work with major OEMs on actual vehicle production programs. And we're, that's really the, lever, the, the expertise we are leveraging right now um, to get to scale production, because that's, you know, we're uh, it, it sort of standing on the shoulders of giants, um, <laughs> people who have been cutting their teeth in this field for decades um, and, and letting that um, t- taking advantage of that to not not stumble as we as we really ramp up. Cool. All right, we're going to talk about the design a little bit more later because I'm going to get to that. But um, so, but just really quickly first. Um, so you started deliveries in the fall of 2019, so just a little over a year ago, correct? And it's mostly West Coast at this point, or is it entirely West Coast? Uh, mostly West Coast. Okay. Uh, we do have our very first rental franchise is open in Key West presently. So. They got their first vehicles almost one year ago. I was actually, I, I, I was there for that handoff um, and uh, what a different world that was. But, but so they, <laughs> they are renting vehicles now um, in, in Florida and we have, 
a small handful of vehicles up in the New York area, some of our very early uh, supporters and investors up there. Um, but because in, in, the, in the initial year, year and a half of an EV program, you run into all sorts of uh, you know, challenges with early vehicles on the road. We wanted to make sure those were relatively close to home uh, to make for a manageable service um, right. you know, uh, problem. Now that I'm, I'm very glad we did that because the pandemic has has made that a, a much more complicated uh, effort. But now that we feel like we are really uh, on top of uh, certainly the the early quality and service issues with um, with with our initial hundred plus vehicles out there in the world, um, we we expect that we will start uh, opening up new service areas. And I think. It's 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 not a giant stretch to say that Florida is is top of the list. Okay, it seems like a perfectly good environment too because it's you know relatively mild, so people can drive around in an un, you know uncovered car. But but it rains a lot there too. So <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, Glenn Glenn's experience in the villages, you know, that's that's to my understanding, sixty thousand registered golf carts on the road in one city. So. Wow. This is this, this Florida should not be a super tough market for us. I think. It's, <laughs> I, I'm, Speaking but, of which, I'm actually I'll, I'll turn back to you, Glenn, for a minute, or maybe both of you can chime in on this. But of course, as you mentioned, you recently inked a deal with the city of Orlando. Um, can you just describe what this deal entails and why it's important to the company and, of course, to the city of Orlando yeah, and possibly the state? We we are super honored to have launched this pilot with Orlando, um, and I think Glenn gave a little bit of the flavor for how forward forward looking Orlando has been, uh, in in terms of really looking at the problem of mobility and electrification, uh, and you know really that whole clean transport field. I've been uh, even uh, uh, and particularly on the autonomous side to say we want this geography to be uh, really a proving ground for the future of vehicles. Um, and so to be able to, to team up with them and, and actually say, you know, they're, they're testing Archimoto vehicles across six different departments in the city to see where, what really are the, the sweet spots in terms of city fleets. And we think that, that um, the, the results of that will, you know, hopefully bear fruit, not just in Orlando, but, but be a good model for cities around the country. Cool. Um, so, Glenn, what, what markets are, they, are you guys looking at? Well, as far as when we got the vehicles to come here, uh, our goal, because I was on so many committees for sustainability, uh, VW mitigation, uh, we did pass two bills here recently within the last year. One of them was House Bill 311, which spoke directly towards autonomous vehicles being commercial fleet vehicles and also being forward thinking enough here in our state. They signed a House Bill uh, 7018, which is infrastructure for electric fleet vehicles. And by getting the infrastructure built here, we can actually start utilizing these pieces of equipment for, for real applications, you know, for people that are gonna be in the commercial fleet for the uh, municipalities to be able to put them to work and to see what the case study can look like across six different divisions here in Orlando. They're gonna be able to pilot these things and to see, you know, how it's gonna impact the fire department, how it's gonna impact the police department. Uh, permitting, parking departments, the, the range is vast and we're just scratching the surface right now of what we feel is going to be something that we can transition this uh, kind of like a cookie cutter thing throughout the entire state and then to other states and then globally. That's awesome. So is, is, is the bottom line, the bottom line, is this all a financial thing or is it also to try to help the, the world to, you know, to be a better place in the future? Well, well, well Personally, whenever I got into this, it was about the ROI. It was about the return on investment. Because like Mark said, it just made no sense that we were transporting 85% of the time one and two passengers in 4,000 pounds of equipment that cost fifty to $70,000. You just were not going to see a substantial amount of return on your investment. However, with an Arcimoto being two-thirds less the cost of an automobile and you're, you're servicing 85% of your market, I'm not saying it does everything. But right. you are servicing your target market, and also you can get people that aren't used to uh, being able to pay a, a higher price point for a vehicle or a brand new vehicle in the loop and being able to utilize something that's non-combustible, good for the environment, clean air, and especially you're in a COVID environment where you need to be breathing clean air. Right. You know, so <laughs> all of those things kind of made the perfect storm of bringing Arcimoto here to Orlando. That's great. I, I would say from the from the venture perspective, you know, I, I think I've 
from the very beginning, I mean, some have accused me of opportunism generally, but I, I would say in this case, it was more just looking at the picture of the world, even in 2007, um, the, the writing was on the wall in terms of climate change. Uh, now, it, the, 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 I mean, it's here, the, the right. substantial effects, and they will continue um, to, to get more and more challenging. Um, and that's why it's just so critically important that as a world, we move to better solutions. And I just, right. I just didn't see it out there. Uh, I, I, I couldn't find what I was looking for. And that was what really spurred me to kind of go all in on, on clean transportation. And I think I, I did that back then thinking that, that it was, had a very high probability of failure. Uh, <laughs> I think at, at that point, I was really only hoping that if we failed, we could at least fail well. Right, uh, right. provide a, a model that that you know, adds something to the conversation. Um, it has been very heartening now to see so many folks uh, jump on uh, jump on board and help push. Uh, and and now it's now it's a question of how fast can we scale uh, to really start making a, a truly meaningful impact on the problem. That's uh, awesome. So, and, yeah, and, it, and even it, within the realm of battery electric vehicles, of course. The, if you think about like a, a Tesla Model Y, it's a, I think it's a 4,000 pound vehicle. There's a lot of material involved in building it. I love it. It's a great car, but there, there's a, a substantial and also the energy to charge it, of course. You know, there's, there's a lot of negative impacts of the fact that it's so large. And if you really do need to just transport one or two people or some cargo around, um, it makes sense that there's a smaller vehicle that's lighter, has a smaller battery pack. Yeah. And, and the, the, I mean, I think. Tesla has, has just done such a phenomenal job in every single way. Um, you know, and, and what is so cool is that they have, in order to solve that 4,000 pound uh, electric car problem, they have gone and figured out how to, uh, I mean, if you, if you saw their battery day presentation, oh, yeah. it was just this mind blowing, uh, uh, just how much they have done to rethink uh, the battery production process by making it much more sustainable, taking out a lot of the cost, improving energy density, I mean, just kind of across the board. And without that goal of getting a 4,000 pound vehicle down the road, um, they, they wouldn't have done that. Uh, but I think as we look at what is the transportation landscape of the future look like, uh, uh, there will be, I mean, you think about 20% of vehicle trips in those big vehicles, that's still a lot of vehicles. But for um, for for the the one two person run around town, I think that this that that really does point to a different platform. Right. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm just going to take a real quick break here to plug the uh, the channel. If you're enjoying this video and you want to see more of this, definitely make sure you like and subscribe because YouTube's algorithm works that way. Also, a big shout out to my Patreon patrons, including Glenn Cook. <laughs> so this is how this whole thing came to be, which is great. Um, so anyway, I would love to talk about technology in your vehicles because that's kind of the focus of this channel. So I will start off with, um, and, and we'll, we'll work our way through so we can just talk about like design and construction of the vehicle first, but what important technology is there is there in the design and build of your vehicle that makes it special, including potentially, I know I've seen Sandy Monroe talk about his die casting machine before. Are you thinking about using that, uh, the big giant one? <laughs> if you look at our, our patent portfolio, the probably the, the most critical uh, technologies that we have developed are really, you know, one is just the vehicle architecture itself. Um, we also have developed a, a novel approach to our dual motor gearbox. We've got some uh, some bits of IP in the drive in the in the actual you know the battery system that we developed a, a novel method for for crimping uh, high power cells together. Um, and, but it's it's really you know I would say largely we are a technology integrator. Now we've so we've been very particular particularly uh, in, in terms of getting to sort of the, the launch, production launch version of the vehicle, we were very uh, particular about where we wanted to develop new technologies and where we wanted to take readily available tech off the shelf. Um, building a 1,300 pound vehicle gave us an advantage in that there really already was an existent marketplace for electric motors in that power range, batteries sufficient to get you to the grocery store and back and so on. Um, as we look as we look towards sort of next generation 
uh, mass production version uh, of the product, then I think we're going to start to see more and more sort of bespoke elements that are, are, are particular to our vehicle platform. And that's primarily just uh, in order to reduce cost. And I think you can look at, you know, even looking at, uh, you know, what, what Tesla has done with battery production, it's really, it's technology in the service of affordability. And, and so in your mind, the, the vertical integration is, it's less about protecting IP and things, it's more about just being as cost efficient as possible. Yeah, well, when you think about the grain of sand that's got to travel around the planet six times to go into your battery cell, clearly uh, we can do better. Right, um, okay. And so that's, that, that's ver vertical integration is definitely a piece of that. Uh, I, I think we have, when you think about sort of the, the mega castings that Tesla has done, um, I, I don't think that we are going to require quite that level of, of uh, metallurgy support um, because simply because we're building something that's uh, small enough that it can use conventional casting technologies to do right. various pieces. But we, we, we will see a shift in our methodology. So right now, the, the vehicle is largely made out of, uh, you know, folded sheet metal and, and CNC bent tube, sort of sheet metal and tube origami. <laughs> um, I think as we go to to higher volumes, some of those pieces are going to get uh, sort of hard tooled up for um, more high volume methods. But those would be more typical uh, sort of traditional automotive methods. Right. Right. So the advantage, of course, of having the smaller car vehicle is that you can you can use a lot of the traditional. You know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I guess, which basically Tesla has had to do over and over again to do what they do. Right. Although we do, we are the beneficiary of right. advances in the in the industry generally. Right. So so the the industry wide uh, decrease in cost of batteries is you know is is to the benefit of Arkimoto customers as well. Um, sure. But we we haven't had to. It's it's sort of like uh, you know it's 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 a nice to have, not a not a have to have right. uh, for the platform that we're developing. All of our efforts really are about. How do we get our our platform to not need as much? Um, instead of uh, sort of how, how do we get uh, the extra stuff to cost less? Right. Okay. It all works together. Okay. So actually, speaking of that, what important technology do you see in the battery pack and the drivetrain of the car? And is is your battery pack now? Is it twenty kilowatt hours? Is that correct? Is that it's nineteen point two? Okay. So, uh, to me, the the most important technologies in the battery pack are um, I would say things that get rid of uh, uh, rare earths or, or conflict minerals or things that are, 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 are environmentally destructive to, uh, to mine. Uh, get, getting toxins out of the process is huge. Uh, getting recyclability baked in from day one. Uh, oh. So having, having a full sort of cradle to cradle. And then Anything that can be done to increase energy density, increase life cycle, those are all um, the sort of the, the really key technology directions that are important in the in the battery space, um, and and we don't really do any of those. Um, right. Those are those are driven largely by cell manufacturers, and and we have uh, we are not uh, presently and currently have no plans to manufacture our own battery cells. Right. But you do, you said you, do you integrate it at the pack level? You said you do have some IP involved with that. Yes. So we take cells and we build them into packs. And, and that is, that's definitely part of our, our IP portfolio is it, both in terms of patent and, uh, and then the actual specific methodology we use to produce a uh, high energy density, robust pack architecture. Um, and I, I, it, to me, that, that actually, that differentiation has, has made a lot of sense really from day one is uh, don't make the cells, make the packs. And right. so that, you know, it doesn't, to me, make a lot of sense to have uh, a, an intermediary in the pack production process. Um, but cells are a nice, nice unit of production that we can just right. uh, take in and, and build products with. Yeah, it is interesting because certainly as a consumer of these technology, as I, you know, until relatively recently, I hadn't really thought about the pack level and how important how you construct the pack is and how you get energy in and out of it efficiently without overheating things. And it's, it's a pretty challenging. It's a, it's a, it's a huge, uh, you know, sort of thermodynamic challenge. It's a mechanical engineering challenge. It's an electrical engineering challenge. 
Um, and it's there are a, a ton of different concerns from pack longevity to safety, power delivery, heating and cooling. I mean, it's just, yeah, the, the, the pack is a, is a tricky part of the puzzle for sure. Uh, Glenn, have we're in discussions with Orlando, like or or any other cities for that matter? Where, have there been discussions about concern about the battery packs, like you know the Sam the <laughs> the classic like Samsung catching on fire in an airplane kind of thing? Were there ever discussions about that, or are people pretty? Actually, we just had some discussions about that just yesterday. I was down at the fleet office, and uh, they've actually got software built into the Arcimoto that doesn't allow it to overcharge or become more volatile. Uh, so that's one of the key components. They can basically hook it up to a level one charger, charge four to five miles in an hour, leave it charged. It'll charge up to 90 percent and then it'll just stop. So they don't have to worry about that ve that vehicle battery pack becoming volatile and combustible. Yeah, I mean, fi fire is a is a major concern in the development of vehicle batteries. Uh, well, any electronic battery. Uh, right. <laughs> that's definitely been a, one of our primary concerns for many years. OK. Uh, and we're we're. Uh, I think fortunate at this point that that we have uh, have, have yet to have a, an event, and so uh, you know, knock on wood. Um, <laughs> but, but also, you know, you, you think about it just in terms of obviously the risk to the owners and and occupants uh, and structures, and also it's sort of the, the worst case thing you can do with something that you want to reduce emissions is have it turn into a torch. So <laughs> yeah. definitely, definitely a concern of ours. Okay. All right. So good to know. Um, and, and so also, how about software? Do you have proprietary software in the vehicle? Uh, I mean, if you could discuss it, I don't know if you could talk about it. And, and also, how important do you feel like software is versus chemistry versus design, et cetera, et cetera? Well, well software, I mean, we, we definitely have our own proprietary software, both in the vehicle and in the organization that for things like managing the fleet and uh, connecting it, but ultimately that the software is the um, it's it's the interface between all of the various different systems, and so that runs from our manufacturing processes through to uh, the sales process on the web, uh, the work we're doing in terms of app development, so that you can easily uh, you know, uh, eventually rent your neighbor's vehicle or rent a vehicle uh, that's that's just with with a with a simple uh, app on the cell phone. Um, to things like torque vectoring in the drive unit that we plan for, uh, that, that will be a software upgrade where, you know, because we have two different motors driving the front wheels, there's no differential. The differential is, uh, is, is done in software. Uh, and now we have what is, what is a, a pretty simple differential software algorithm, but what we intend to do over time is to improve that, which will add benefit to traction, uh, handling and so on. Um, and that, those are all pieces of our software puzzle. Gotcha. Uh, so I would say, yeah, software is a, is a major effort of the company. The one piece that we've sort of avoided at the, to this point is the, the software and sensor stack for autonomy. Okay. So we've been very focused on building a vehicle platform that can take um, you know, steering and uh, throttle and braking commands and so, so that a, a higher level driving sensor and software stack could be placed on the Arcimoto platform and you'd have a self-driving super, super efficient vehicle. Right. Um, but we haven't actually, we don't, and we don't presently plan to do that piece of the puzzle because we see so many different, incredibly brilliant groups out there cracking that code from a bunch of different angles. Oh, cool. We think our, our, our piece of it right now is to really just go squarely after the vehicle platform, figure out how to produce that at scale uh, and then team up with one or more players in the autonomous okay. space uh, to, to really complete the whole puzzle. And that's where I say Arcimoto really is, I mean, we are all about working together with everyone out there to solve what is an existential threat to, to uh, sure. at least living systems on the world. Okay. Oh, that's, I, I find that really fascinating. So, I mean, you'd be open to like comma AI or mobile eye or something like that as or potentially multiple ones, depending on what role the vehicle was playing. Yeah, and you know, like what Comma AI is doing is awesome. You know, the, the right. Building an open source self-driving stack is incredible. So, um, you know, major respect to that effort, and and both in terms of philosophy and in terms of results on the road. Right. Um, and, and again, I, I don't I don't think that we're in a position now 
uh, to to figure out even really who's going to be the winner. There may be many winners uh, of that particular challenge. We just want to make sure that the Arkimoto is is a very good platform for those right. solutions to find a pathway into market. Okay. Uh, and I guess maybe for both of you, I think uh, over the air updates, which was a thing people never really associated with vehicles before, but now of course Tesla and other companies have started introducing that, and it's like super critical <laughs> to, to do this. So how important? I guess how important for, in the discussion with Orlando and other cities is over the air updates, and how important is it for Arkimoto in terms of the way that you're you know building your vehicles? Well, that's that's it's a it, we've we've had the hardware for it built in since we went into production. Um, that will be there will be one sort of manual update uh, that will require. And you think about it, so the, the reason for over there updates is so you don't have to do what I'm about to describe, which right. is go <laughs> to the field and do uh, some amount of labor to uh, to to update it, make sure all the systems check out, and so on. Once that and once that that sort of final in field update is done, then it'll it will turn on the over there update uh, capabilities for the Arc Model platform and. You know, we've, we've just watched, all, all you have to do is have watched the difference between Tesla and every other automaker doing software recalls. And, you know, Tesla's like, well, you know, you got your recall notice and actually it's already in your vehicle and running. <laughs> all the rest are take it down to the shop, get as, you know, as soon as you can. It, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major deal, particularly okay. as vehicles get more and more um, driven by software. Right. The ability to update that software without having to, have it be you know sort of physically manipulated is a big deal right oh no yeah you know, i have a car we have a mazda and the closest dealership is about 60 miles away so every time there's any kind of recall notice it's just like uh you know you have to make a whole day out of it rather right. than just it's done so uh glenn has that has has that has that been part of the conversation or do people really not think about that because i think about fleet vehicles and how long they're on the road and owned by a, a city or government then they, they probably want to think about that right yeah, one of the things that we are directing everybody to do right now, though, is to get the experience with the vehicle. You know, until they experience the vehicle, uh, get an opportunity to realize we're not going to try to be a automobile. It's a, it's basically an auto cycle, and it's a totally different mindset. And the technology that comes with that comes with kind of retraining what you need to be able to do. And the software that they're going to be able to incorporate in this is going to come directly from Mark. It's going to come directly from the um, team in, in Eugene. And the over-the-air updates will come in the future. But right now, it's just getting the, uh, the news out there to people that there's a different form of mobility. There's a different solution out there. And changing the mindset of people's mobility solutions in general is what our goal is here. Cool. All right. That's yeah. I guess that's that's it's 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 like I guess a chicken and egg thing, right? So you don't want to worry about the other stuff till later on. So, um, Mark, do you consider your company a kind of a new Tesla, like a startup focused on changing the world with battery electric vehicles? Do you consider yourself in competition with Tesla or and other BEV manufacturers, or is your product so different and unique that you feel like you're kind of complementary with them? Uh, you know, I, I think that we I, I we have the same mission. Uh, as as Tesla have from the very beginning, um, we ha are building something that is is I think very differentiated from their product offerings. Um, so I, I see them as as really the you know the the halo pushing the global industry forward. I mean, it's kicking and screaming really. Right. Um, and uh, and and uh, I, they have Elon has stated on a number of occasions um, that he does not want to do you know two and three wheel vehicles, which. Um, I, I, I think again, we, we can fill that niche just fine. Um, and uh, to my mind, the, the competition is uh, an outdated set of ideas and um, a, sort of the inertia of a hundred years of internal combustion. And the more players there are out there making real strides at solving that, um, the merrier. You know, it's uh, it, so. so um, I, I I would like to think that. Our own what what drives us forward um, to 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 push 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 is not um, what other EV companies are doing out in the world. It's that we face an existential threat and we need to solve it as soon as we possibly can. Right. So again, the more players in that field, the better, because of course, the faster you can make the changes, the better. So yeah. 
Uh, just to turn to the future a little bit, after the FUV, you, in fact, it just, I think within the last week or so, you publicized the Roadster, which is more of a motor, motorcycle-like kind of sporty, you gets rid of the, uh, the, the canopy and everything. Uh, first of all, is the name Roadster a way of connecting your company with Tesla, or is that just coincidence? And no, it, also, you know, can you give us some hints about that, that product beyond the, the really brief press release? Yeah, well, so, so Roadster is, is a pretty generic term, um, and we've seen other, other vehicles in the three-wheeled space name products, Roadsters. Uh, so that was just, it's just more of a, 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 I think, sort of a generic name for super fun on-road machine. Um, and we, we really, although the fun utility vehicle has that baked into its name, um, it doesn't, we, we don't position it as a, as, as a toy. Um, I mean, right. it has toy qualities, but it is a very useful everyday vehicle for going to work and getting groceries. Right. Um, I think with the Roadster, what we wanted to do was just say, well, if we take, a, if we actually go, you know, in, in and the, the the Arc Moto platform is a motorcycle platform. Three wheelers are motorcycles, um, but we if we say, well, let's take away the the cage, let's take away the the seat belts, you know, you'll wear a helmet like you would on a typical two wheel motorcycle and just see what happens when you remove that weight, when you, when you get into a, 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 the ability to get into a crouching position or really move your body with the vehicle. And it turns out it is an absolute blast. <laughs> uh, I was surprised at how surprised I was at how just how fun it is to drive. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I have to say, I I was like, oh man, I want one of those really, really bad. The other one looks really cool and interesting in a great city car. But I was like, man, that Roadster, I, I think I would get in line to, to buy one of those. So maybe I would. Well, and we, we sent one. So we we sort of, we, we got it on the road, validated that it was just insanely fun, and then sent the prototype off to Mike Corbin uh, at Corbin Pacific. He took one ride and said to Terry, our, our COO, he said, that's the most, uh, that, that, that's the best riding three-wheeler I've ever rode. Wow. Uh, and he, he actually said it to him twice, and then he put it in the press release. So um, you can take my word for it, but obviously I've, I, I may have some bias uh, <laughs> to, have a, to have a guy with with that much um, sort of, uh, you know, just decades of of legend in the motorcycle arena have have that same response, I think, is is telling. And, uh, you know, for us, it, it serves you know a couple of purposes. One, uh, we are pushing to to get to mass production as rapidly as we can. So each additional product line that we add on the same platform is additive to scale. Um, and then it also, I think it, it gives us a halo uh, sort of fun machine that, that, that will be truly eye catching out there for people interested in the brand. Cool. Uh, do you have, I mean, is there anything else you can talk about for your future roadmap or is that all kind of hush hush until, you know, they're released or are you just focusing on these two right now? <laughs> Well, so we've we've announced we've either teased or announced five products up to now: the FUV, the uh, Deliberator, Rapid Responder. Uh, right at the end of the summer, we showed the Cameo, which is our uh, it, it's a vehicle we built because we needed it. We do a lot of on-road filming, and so we built a, a special purpose version of the platform for film, uh, sporting events, uh, influencers. Um, and that will also become our flatbed utility vehicle platform as well. Uh, and then the Roadsters, the, the final one that we have announced so far. Super. Wow. But I can tell from the response that you have some other stuff percolating in there, which is great. I love it. <laughs> but, yeah, but the basic idea is you're going to kind of utilize that three-wheeled platform as kind of a way of building out different uh, markets. And each of, each, of our, each of our products is really, I mean, it's, it's it's almost one product that then just gets turned into uh, a, a, a mission specific job vehicle uh, really at the end of the production process. So we're, we're envisioning a, a, a forking assembly line where, you know, the, the, as it, as it move, you know, the, the platforms move through the process. And then once it gets to that point of differentiation, it'll fork off into one or more lines that do the finishing steps. But it's a little bit different than uh, the sort of traditional automotive platform concept where the, the differentiation between each product is actually very large. Right. So, you know, an automotive platform might, might share 40% of the same parts. I think Tesla's really pushed that to 80%. 
with the Arcimoto, it's like 95% of the same parts on every vehicle that we do. So drivetrains, batteries, motors, et cetera, are all Same pretty skills. generic to it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Everything. Cool. Except for the very last steps. Right. And I will say that here in Orlando, we are really going to see the impact of the deliverator. That's going to be one of those areas that be between DoorDash and Uber Eats and being able to do grocery deliveries, that, that's going to be one of those areas that we're going to be able to utilize the gig economy worker and to be able to sublease these types of things or or market share the, the vehicles between multiple operators. And that way you get the most utilization out of these things possible. Right. Yeah, that last mile problem is always the big thing with deliveries. And so that that it seems like this is a perfect thing because it's so economical and it's the right size for smaller delivery. You know, <laughs> you can't go to Lowe's and put a bunch of like lumber on it, but it's perfect for smaller package deliveries, groceries. Uh, yeah, I mean, you think about the, if you're an Amazon customer, what were the last 10 things you got off Amazon? Yeah, they're all odds good. are all of them were fit into the deliverator at the same time. Right. Yeah. So that's perfect. Uh, do either of you have any other thoughts for us? Otherwise, I can wrap it up. Well, I I, I hope your uh, I hope your Thanksgiving holiday treats you well. I hope you're staying healthy and safe. Yeah. Um, uh, just a reminder to everyone out there that this brutal pandemic is something that if we all work together on, we actually can make a significant difference on it. So, uh, mask up. <laughs> stay safe. We're gonna, we're gonna we're gonna get through this, right um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, oh. for having me on the program and yeah. and on the story. Yeah, thank you. And Glenn, the main thing is is that if we can get these things scaled up, get more of them on the road, get people to experience them, that's that's where you're gonna see uh, the biggest ramp up in this product because I do believe that once people get in the seat of an Arcimoto, it's life transforming. It's it's the experience that makes the difference. Yeah, I have, I have to say, I can't wait, <laughs> personally. Uh, I, yeah, I, I would I would say that that, that is one thing just that we, we believe our, our big challenge right now, the one that we are focusing all of our energy on is building to scale. Um, there, you know, we, we, the demand sort of generates itself once they get out there, uh, but you, you know, get in the driver's seat, you'll see. Cool. That sounds like a good way to end that thing. So thank you, gentlemen, both. I really appreciate it, especially because it's the day before Thanksgiving here in the US. Um, if you have questions for either of them, definitely ask them in the comments, or you can also use my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Or if you guys want to, I can put your email addresses in the uh, description as well. So you can check that as well. Trolling the uh, the comment threads of interview videos we do. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye out. Sounds great. <laughs> All right. Thank you again both so much. Until next time, we'll see you. Bye. Thanks a lot.